Wow, you're zipping through space in a large ship as big as three New York City Central Parks. There's a lot of commotion going on. No, it's not some alien invading the spaceship. It's a very important day. The date is January 22nd, 2700. You've just been born outside of the Earth's atmosphere. Happy birthday! There's a medical team attending to everything. Futuristic gadgets help out with every aspect. And the view from the giant spherical glass ship is nothing but the incredible vastness of space. You can't even see Earth anymore. The spaceship is flying to a new destination millions of miles away. ETA on reaching that new host planet? Decades. Fast forward a bit. You're 25 years old. And this spaceship's the only home you've ever known. (laughs) So far. You've learned all the ins and outs of the ship. You start your day in your dorm, which has all the essentials. A small compact bathroom, a mini kitchen, a bunk bed, and a magnificent view of the stars and planet outside the ship's reinforced glass. And you never need to worry about space radiation. The ship has an everlasting magnetic shield that reflects space radiation, so it doesn't seep its way onto the ship. Otherwise, there'd be big problems. The ship was designed to have artificial gravity. Astronauts normally lose 1-2% to of their bone density every month they're up in space, since they're just floating around all the time. But now, I mean in the future, in deep space travel, they're able to solve this problem. You make your way out of your dorm and see a wave of fellow crew members making their way to work. They're all gliding through on their advanced mini hoverboards, and everyone's wearing different colors, a space-age uniform. Yours is blue, so you hop on your board and join the blue wave. You get to the underpass of the space transport and begin your work. As an engineer on board, your job is super important, maintaining the ship and keeping it running. But something's wrong. Numbers are flashing all over the panels, and the dreaded red light won't stop blinking. You alert your co-workers, but they don't know what's happening either. Quick, you keep checking the logs and all the complicated equations, but nothing adds up. Panic starts to spread throughout the ship. The hair on your arms is standing on end. You try to click on as many buttons and switches as you can. The buzzing keeps getting louder and louder. The light is flashing brighter. Some of your colleagues make a break for it, and you're all alone in the red room. Suddenly, finally, your supervisor rushes down to help. After a while, the two of you figure it out. Whew, that was close. You still have a lot to learn about managing the ship. Since your early years, you were assigned to work as an engineer. You were great at physics, chemistry, math, all those sciencey things. It's just another day in the office. But on this ship, you may make captain one day. After work, you get a call from your friends wanting to hang out. And when I say call, I mean a phoneless device that lets you communicate with anyone while seeing all their info through a hologram projection that only you can see. You can also use it to listen to old tunes from Earth. Pop music has now become classical music, and movies are now 3D projections of your own imagination. You make your way out of the underpass and go up to the space plaza. That's where everyone hangs out when they have time off. Some cafes, restaurants, a barber shop, even an ice cream parlor. You've never hung out anywhere else. The space transport is essentially a small city, which has all the important things society needs. That includes a biosphere full of animals and plants from different climates on Earth. Many tropical forests, many deserts, many rainforests, you name it. The biologists on board make sure to keep it all healthy, so you feel like you're at home. Not that you've ever set foot on Earth. You enter the wild savanna and see some gazelles galloping around. A few wildebeest seem to be rummaging around, and a small pack of lions are on the prowl. In the jungle, you feel the humidity and the thick leaves and bushes all around. Some mountain gorillas are playing, and there are little tree frogs here and there. And lurking in the trees, making its way down for a sip of water, is a jaguar. Over in the dry desert, you see some roaming camels, a little rattlesnake slithering its way out of the heat, and some little scorpions crawling around in the sand. You've learned a whole lot of biology these last 25 years. You know all about Earth, but you've never been there. Weird. After the tour of nature's habitats, you hear an announcement on the PA. It's the captain. The new planet is hours away, earlier than anticipated. 
Everyone, assume positions for landing. Everyone on the ship rushes to their dormitories, except the key crew members needed to run the ship. You strap into your bunk bed that turns into a seat with fancy interstellar seat belts. You look out your window and see a blue dot in the distance. It gets bigger and bigger, and it looks a whole lot like Earth, from far away at least. That didn't take all that long, only 25 years. Wonder what's going under the hood of that spaceship. You look back at your life in space, knowing this first part of it is coming to an end. It's kind of like living at the South Pole. At the bottom of the world lives a small community of scientists who work between winter and summer doing all kinds of research, from climate and geology to meteorology and astronomy. Their lives must be similar to living here in outer space. They have their own bunkers, scientific labs, and even recreational rooms for sports and music. The nature on the planet you're approaching is unlike anything on Earth. Tropical trees soaring higher than the highest skyscrapers. Oceans that are so wild, there are hurricanes that last for years, just roaming about. The pilot announces the landing. It's all good. Time to get to work. You unstrap yourself and head outside to see the new planet for yourself. Walking on land feels like, well, like arriving on a new planet. The humidity is thick and the wind is warm. The ship landed on the tropical side of the planet, where studies show is the best place to begin a brand new settlement. It's not going to be easy. Humans usually begin new settlements next to lakes and rivers. Think of the Mesopotamians, the ancient Egyptians, the Aztecs. The list is endless. They began as small settlements until they grew to be fully functioning mega-civilizations. By trading and exploring, they were able to advance their technology, learn new languages, and discover awesome cooking recipes. Hey, I could go for some pasta and sushi right about now. According to scientists, being born in space could alter the way humans look. Human heads could be bigger within thousands of generations. Who knows? There's no way to simulate it on Earth. We can even have different new skin colors, since we would need more melanin, that pigment stuff that protects us from sun radiation. Being closer to the sun or any hot burning mass of fire might mean we'd produce more or different kinds of melanin to protect us. We might turn dark brown, purple, gray, or even green. We'd have to wait a couple of million years to find out. And with no gravity, humans would have to get used to having a lower bone density, kind of like birds have. That means we'd probably be weaker than our old Earth human cells and have some slightly odd physical things going on. Gravity is essential for our balance, and mobility is one of the key factors for human survival. So without gravity, we'd most likely have exoskeleton suits for walking and running, or taking out the trash. Now, nothing like this is going to happen for a very long time. They're still brainstorming how to bring someone into this world, or out of this world. Technically speaking, outer space is considered to be 62 miles above sea level from any continent on the world. Beyond that, endless possibilities. April 12th, in the year 2212. It's a great date for humanity. The 300th anniversary of the launch of the legendary Titanic. The best engineers of the world have collaborated for years to bring their masterpiece to the public. The Space Tanic. And they've done it just in time. The glorious spaceship is waiting in its harbor under the limelight, photographed by thousands of people. The trip was scheduled for April 12th, just like 300 years ago. Finally, the big day has come. The passengers are going on board the most magnificent spaceship of the time. They call it unbreachable. It has 12 decks, from the third class closer to the bottom, to the most luxurious first class on the top, with panoramic views of outer space. The ship is preparing for launch. The engines are starting, the final countdown has begun, and the Space Tannic is off into the sky. It quickly becomes no more than a speck in the big blue and then disappears. The first day of the flight goes perfectly. The ship leaves the Earth's atmosphere in less than an hour, and passengers enjoy the wonderful view outside. The blue and green planet on the backdrop of the black void of space. The ship slows down a bit as it moves into orbit. There are too many satellites and space debris circling around the Earth. The Space Tannic has to go carefully 
and maneuver around the chunks of metal floating in zero-g. One of them heads straight towards the ship, but it turns on the side burners and moves out of the way just in time. The scrap floats by safely. Finally, the ship is out of the danger zone and into the big black. It turns on the back thrusters to accelerate and heads to the bright side of the moon. It's going to be the first destination of the sightseeing tour. The planet becomes gradually smaller behind, and about halfway to the natural satellite, people on board can marvel at the sight of the sun. The huge ball of burning plasma is bigger and brighter than ever in the cosmic darkness. Suddenly, the ship's captain makes an announcement. All passengers are invited to the promenade decks to watch as the solar panels are being unfolded. People go outside to goggle at the sight. The silver and black panels slowly emerge from their containment slots, and the space tannic finally takes its real form. As the sun's energy begins to flow into the ship, the thrust engines turn to minimum. The spaceship is now in energy-collecting mode. For the trip to Mars to take just a few days, it needs to make a transit jump. In another five hours, another announcement rings across the board. The ship is approaching the moon, and the passengers are invited to look at the satellite from up close. The space tannic passes by at several thousand miles, and the moon looks huge. All the craters on the satellite, even the smallest ones, are clearly visible. The view is outstanding. The moon is left behind, and lights on the ship go dim. There's no natural change of day and night in space, so the crew monitors the time and imitates the shift. The next day promises nothing of interest, as there's going to be a long traverse between the moon and Mars. The passengers are wandering off to their cabins to sleep. The next two days go uneventful. On the decks, there are numerous types of entertainment for guests. From gyms and swimming pools to game rooms and dancing halls. People wander around the promenade decks, enjoying the serene views of space. Nothing bodes trouble. On the fourth day, the captain finally announces that the space tannic is preparing for the transit jump in 30 minutes. When the time comes, the passengers only feel a slight tug as the huge vessel leaps through space-time, entering the vicinity of Mars. Many passengers go outside to look at the red planet, which is already visible in the dark abyss. The tour is entering its final stage, but the landing is only planned for late night. At 11 p.m., when most passengers were already in their beds, the space tannic begins the final maneuvers. It has to make a little roundabout trip over Mars because the port is on the other side of the planet. The flight is nearing its end, only a couple of hours left before landing. The ship is in the orbit on the far side of Mars. Everything's quiet. Too quiet. All of a sudden, an enormous boom thrashes the whole space tannic, throwing sleeping people out of their beds. Blinking emergency lights turn on. Everyone's confused, but no announcement comes from the captain. And only those who have been on the starboard side promenade deck notice the horrible detail. The right front wing has been torn off and is zooming past them towards the stern. Pressing their faces to the glass, straining to look at the hull, they see a huge gash near the nose of the ship. The space tannic shudders again, and chunks of metal fly out of the gaping hole. The ship rapidly loses pressurization. Meanwhile, the broken-off wing hit the stern and left another gash in it. Mechanisms in the engine compartment start to fall apart and are dragged into space. The ship groans and comes to a halt suspended thousands of miles above Mars. At last, the captain announces through the intercom that the space tannic has unexpectedly collided with a rogue asteroid. All passengers are asked to proceed to their respective decks for evacuation. Within an hour, all rescue capsules are occupied and ready to be deployed. But about a third of the passengers are still on board the ship. It turns out many of the capsules were blown away at the collision. History seems to repeat itself. 
The captain still orders to deploy the capsules, and they whoosh out of containment tanks, leaving hundreds of people behind. Some left without their family members, not knowing what fate awaits them. The capsules float in space for a few seconds, and then turn on their thrust engines, heading to the Martian surface. Another order from the captain. Everyone is to go down to their cabins and put on pressurized suits stored under their beds. As the passengers rush to comply, the space Tannic sends distress signals to Mars and everyone in the vicinity. A hundred thousand miles away, a large trade ship, Leona, picks up the signal and hurries to help. The creaks and groans on board the space Tannic become more and more frantic. People are sitting silently in their cabins. It's quiet on board, except for the sounds of the slowly disintegrating ship. And then, suddenly, a loud snap resonates throughout the space Tannic, and the vessel cracks in two. A gigantic fracture goes from top to bottom, almost perfectly halfway across the decks. Pressurized glass covering the promenade decks shatter into millions of pieces, slowly flying away from the ship. With the decks depressurized, people and things are blown away into outer space. Thankfully, all of the passengers and crew are wearing their suits as ordered, but they only have about an hour before they run out of oxygen. People help each other by floating together and hauling stranded ones to their groups. They can barely control their floating, but somehow they still manage to bring some order to the chaos. Huddled together in orbit above the ominously red planet, they watch as the mighty space Tannic turns into a heaping pile of space debris. 45 minutes have passed. The oxygen is running low, and people try to breathe as slowly and carefully as they can. There's still no help in sight, and they're preparing for the worst. But then, one of them starts waving and pointing somewhere. It's a bright spot, hardly different from the stars in far space. But it's getting closer by the second. And within five minutes, the relieved people see a spaceship speeding towards them. The Leonas arrive just in time to save the day. Quickly, but without hurry, Leona's crew gather everyone floating in space around the remains of the space Tannic and haul them on board their ship. In a few hours, the Leona safely lands at Mars' main spaceport. The newspapers called it the day when the Titanic sank again. What would the Earth look like if it was born in another solar system? I did a little research for you to find out, and the results were surprisingly wholesome. There are some warm tropics, strong winds, and giant dragonflies. But okay, let me explain from the very beginning. Since 1995, NASA has discovered more than 4,100 planets outside the solar system. Unfortunately, most of them are either flying ice balls like Neptune or gas giants like Jupiter. But there are still as many as 161 planets similar to our Earth. And one of them is very close to us, in the Alpha Centauri constellation. There are three stars in this constellation. Two of them are called Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you've probably seen them. They're very bright. Because of that, they look like one big star. They rotate around each other very slowly. And there's the third star chilling around not far from them. It's a teeny tiny red dwarf, Proxima Centauri. It got its name because of its proximity to our Sun. This star is the most interesting one, so let's talk more about it. Proxima Centauri is only 4.5 light years away from us. Oh, and one light year is about 6 trillion miles. Yep. If we went there, it would have taken just a little over 165,000 years of traveling in a space shuttle. Oh, you think that's a lot? For the universe, it's like checking on your fridge. Proxima Centauri is much lighter and much smaller than the Sun. It's also two times colder than the Sun, with a temperature of 3000 Kelvin. That's why we can't see it without a telescope. On the bright side though, it will burn for trillions of years, and you don't have to worry that one day it will eat us like our Sun. And yes, our twin planet is located right next to Proxima Centauri. This planet is called 
Proxima B. Yeah, I know, they got creative with all these names. I hope you won't get confused. It's slightly larger and more massive than the Earth. This planet is located in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. It means that there can be water and even some microorganisms there. Yes, it's possible that one day we'll find some life there. But right now, we don't know much about this mysterious planet. It's probably a rocky planet like our Earth and has a similar landscape, but this is just a theory. Who knows what kind of jokes the universe can throw at us? It would be a shame to fly 165,000 years just to stumble upon a giant piece of ice or something. Fortunately, we probably don't have to wait that long. The big brains are now developing a technology that would allow us to move at the speed close to the speed of light. If they succeed, we'll get to Proxima B in just 20 years! But anyway, this video is not just about Proxima B. It's about what would have happened if life had originated not in our solar system, but in Alpha Centauri. What if we were orbiting Proxima Centauri, or the other two stars? So now, let's imagine that the Earth has replaced Proxima B. I'm going to call this new planet, New Earth. Guess I'm not very creative at naming either. First of all, the orbit. The new Earth must be about 25 times closer to its star than Proxima B is. Otherwise, it would be unimaginably cold. Let's move the planet a little closer. Excellent. The day still lasts 24 hours, but our orbital period is very high. Proxima B revolves around its star in 11 days. But we'll make it in just 8. Hey, a birthday party every week? Sign me up! Oh, hold on, there's another problem. You see, Proxima Centauri is a flare star. This means that sometimes, just out of nowhere, it throws out some stellar winds. These winds carry around a bunch of ionized particles, which then settle on the planets. Yeah, our sun also does that, but Proxima Centauri tries to finish us off 2,000 times harder than our sun so the radiation levels are off the scale, to say the least. Don't worry, it's fine. All we need are incredibly strong magnetic fields. They will help us create a very thick atmosphere that can protect us from the Proxima Centauri's tantrums. So now it's going to be very warm, or not. Another problem. Scientists are still not sure how exactly Proxima Centauri's planets rotate around it. What if they turn out to be tidally locked, like our moon? Then one half of the new Earth will be a frying pan, and the other half will be some frosty deserts. Oh, it's fine, we'll just settle down somewhere in the middle. Didn't expect that I would ever say this, but it will definitely be warm at the North Pole. And if we're lucky with the rotation, we'll just get a cozy, warm planet. The average temperature is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and there aren't any extreme temperatures. On the new Earth, we have much more water. The weather is generally pretty crazy, some very strong winds and quite destructive rains that can go on for quite a long time, but you can adapt. Temperature changes are much more noticeable in the mountains. Just like on Earth, the higher you climb, the colder it gets, except it's very cold right here at the top. Because of this, the mountains and hills have jungles below and snow-covered deserts on the tops. But in general, it's almost like the Earth's tropics. The flora is very rich, the trees are very low, but lush. The thick atmosphere also makes flying easier, so there are a lot of large flying animals. Like dragonflies with a wingspan of 16 feet. Uh-huh, moving on. The sky here is much lighter than that on Earth, and very cloudy. Sometimes it may seem completely white. But the starry night is beautiful and bright. There are four suns. Our main one is Proxima Centauri. We can also see two bright Alpha Centauri stars. And finally, our old sun, which looks like a bright, distant star. I'll allow you to shed a tear for the old Earth. There's a few planets near us, like Proxima Centauri C. The host star is surrounded by two belts of cosmic dust, so get ready for some gorgeous, colorful night views. So what we have in the end is a little crazy, but a beautiful green planet. I personally wouldn't mind moving there already. What about you? Write in the comments. 
All right, so now we know what would have happened if our Earth had been born near Proxima Centauri. What about the other two stars? Unfortunately, we won't be able to rotate near two stars at the same time. Scientists suspect that Alpha Centauri A and B have some kind of common planet that jumps from one orbit to another. But it's probably very cold. Let's choose Alpha Centauri A. Just like on the new Earth, here our average temperatures are about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But now, the temperature variation is quite large. It goes from negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit at the South Pole to 113 degrees Fahrenheit at the equator. Eh, we'll be fine close to the north. The day is still 24 hours, and the orbital period is one year and one month. It's almost the same for the Alpha Centauri b, but the orbital period is about half a year. Other conditions are very similar to those on Earth. Changes in the seasons are almost not noticeable. The temperatures don't change much either. No matter where we settle down, the neighboring star will be clearly visible, but we probably won't see Proxima Centauri. And that's about it. Of course, all this assumes perfect conditions. Just like on Earth, one slightest change, whether it's a thin atmosphere or a bigger distance from the star, and it won't end well. We got really lucky with our Earth. But even so, the chances of finding a habitable planet are very high. Even with the tiniest possibility, there will be about 15 million planets in our universe that we can find life on.